Number 10, Miss Marvel. Miss Marvel was once Carol Danvers and is now Kamala Khan. And of course, for this list, we're focusing on Kamala, who was a new addition to the Avengers team in 2015, after making her first unnamed appearance only two years earlier in 2013 in the comics. Kamala is a huge Carol Danvers fan, which is what inspired her to take up the mantle Miss Marvel after Carol dropped it, taking up the Captain Marvel mantle instead herself. Kamala as Miss Marvel has powers which allow her to alter her body's physiology allowing her to stretch, change size and shape, and in theory, straight up shapeshift. Her powers come from inhuman heritage, which was activated by her exposure to the Terrigen Bomb. Kamala joined the team for a time during all new, all different Avengers, and remains a fan favorite hero at Marvel Comics. And to clarify before we move on to point nine, this is going to be a list of Avengers that have recently come onto the team, as opposed to new Avengers, which is kind of its own thing. There's a lot of new Avengers, so I just want to clarify that. <laughs> Number nine, Wasp. Not the same Wasp who years ago was actually the leader of the Avengers for a while. Nuh uh, we are not talking about Janet Van Dyne here. We are talking about Nadia Van Dyne, who, despite her seemingly misleading name, is actually the daughter of Hank Pym and his first wife, Maria Travoya. After her mother Maria was kidnapped and later killed, Nadia ended up being raised in the Red Room, considered a valuable asset due to her natural aptitude for science and academia, believed to be somewhat in part due to the fact that she was Hank's naturally born daughter. Nadia would eventually escape the Red Room and attempt to locate her father in the US, only to find out that he had recently died during a fight against Ultron. Nadia felt compelled to meet her stepmother, Janet, desiring to become the new Wasp. The two ended up getting along well, and Janet even gave Nadia her blessing to take her last name, seeing her as family. Hence, Nadia became both Nadia Van Dyne and the new Wasp, also going on to join the Avengers team. Number 8, Spider-Man. Peter Parker as Spider-Man has of course teamed up with the Avengers before, but Miles Morales as Spider-Man is a newer addition, not just in terms of the Avengers team, but also still relatively new in terms of him existing in 616. Miles Morales is originally a Spider-Man who hails from the Ultimate Comics line originating in Earth 1610, the Ultimate Universe. He was given a new home on Earth 616 after his world had been destroyed as a result of showing kindness to and sharing food with Molecule Man during the Secret Wars event. True story. Thank goodness for pocket cheeseburgers. Miles has a power set very similar to Peter's in many ways, but also has a few unique abilities of his own. He can shock his opponents with venom blasts and can sneak up on them with his spider camouflage, which he can use to appear invisible. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about even more newest additions to the Avengers we've seen in recent years, be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Number 7, Valkyrie. Valkyrie is Jane Foster, who was originally known as Thor when she joined the Avengers team the first time around. Jane ended up becoming the new Thor after Thor Odinson, the original Thor, was deemed unworthy. As the new Mighty Thor, editorially referred to at times as Lady Thor, Jane joined the Avengers team in the all new, all different Avengers series in 2015. Currently in the comics, Jane is no longer the Mighty Thor, but was welcomed into Asgardia by Odin, who gave her a new title and power set, making her a new Valkyrie. To clarify, I'm saying Asgardia because she was kind of like welcome to the whole world of Asgard, but she didn't like go like live on Asgard or anything specific like that. Currently, Valkyrie is the mantle that she uses. Being imbued with the spirit of Valkyrie Brunhilde gives Jane the strength and power set of an Asgardian warrior. In addition, there are specific powers that are also granted to Valkyries like herself. She can teleport, has death perception, and can see ghosts in addition to to being a super strong and capable fighter. Number six, Starbrand. I kind of miss when Brandy was just like a little Starbrand baby, but of course this is comics and heroes can't stay babies forever. In fact, they can't even stay a baby for more than a year apparently, especially if they're joining the Avengers, which I kind of get. Technically the young Starbrand baby Selby, later given the first name Brandy, was in the care of the Avengers, not really specifically on the team, kind of sort of like their ward. But despite being one of the youngest heroes to ever be a film, affiliated with that team, this little star brand also would often help the team out on missions, being so insanely powerful. Star brand possesses the star brand, which grants her a great amount of basically cosmic power. She is capable of interstellar flight and flight in general, energy manipulation and projection.
production, creating energy blasts, and technically should also be super durable and have some level of healing factor. The Starbrand's power is believed to be potentially infinite when it comes to their power levels, making Starbrand one of the most powerful members on the team, in baby form, child form, or young adult form as she currently is as of the end of issue 52 of the current 2018 Avengers series. In at number 5, Power Man. His real name is Victor Alvarez and he was born and raised in the brutal world of Hell's Kitchen, New York City. As a child, Victor's father was a criminal and therefore sent to Seagate Prison as a result. So he didn't exactly have great role models per se other than his mother that raised him. After the Mighty Avengers were shut down, Power Man along with White Tiger followed each other to join the newly rebranded AIM team which would in part become the new Avengers. Victor would fight side by side with this team for many adventures but ultimately he felt that he was neglecting his home neighborhood for far too long. So we may not see much of Victor Alvarez in terms of MCU but he definitely had a great stint with the new Avengers. And maybe he'll come back, who knows. Just speculation. In at number 4, Wiccan. Billy Kaplan had an interaction with the Avengers at a very early age. While he was dealing with bullies at his school, Billy turned to the Avengers mansion in seek of help. He briefly met his hero, the Scarlet Witch, who told him that he could take care of himself. And boy oh boy, did he take care of himself. I mean, Billy chose to stand up to his bully right when his electrokinetic powers started to emerge. With powers like this, he was already set to follow in the footsteps of Doctor Strange becoming the next Sorcerer Supreme. In the comic books at least, Kaplan and Strange meet when Doctor Strange enters a dimension wherein all past, present, and future sorcerers have gathered. Aside from that, Kaplan was a full time superhero as part of Roberto's team of new Avengers. In at number 3, Kate Bishop. Much like how Billy Kaplan was following in the footsteps of Doctor Strange, Kate Bishop was the third character in the Marvel comic books to take on the Hawkeye mantle following Clint Barton. Allegedly, she will also be a featured character in the upcoming Disney Plus series Hawkeye, which makes perfect sense if you're priming her character to join the new Avengers. Throughout these series, it's believed that Barton will train Kate Bishop following the events of Endgame. Seeing as though he's become Ronan, this leaves the Hawkeye position wide open. Some have also speculated that Lila Barton will essentially be the new Kate Bishop, but at the end of the day, that's up to Marvel's writing team. In at number 2, Iron Lad. With the introduction of Harley Keener in Iron Man 3 and then a brief appearance at the funeral in Endgame, it's clear that they were warming audiences up for Iron Lad. Especially considering the brave sacrifice that Tony Stark made, the opening for the next Iron Man is available and the only possible prospect to fill in is Harley. Now, clearly the comic books are much different than the storyline that the MCU is putting forth, but they rarely do stuff like this for no good reason. So with that in mind and all of the advanced tech that we saw Harley working on as a kid, it's clear to see that Iron Lad will be one of the newest Avengers. Last but not least in our number one spot, Shang-Chi. From the moment Shang was born, he would be raised to become a deadly assassin by his father. Even in his sleep, he would be subjected to alchemy and a virtual reality feed that taught techniques while he slept. Following the events of Avengers vs X-Men, Captain America and Iron Man were looking at expanding their team to make it bigger and stronger than ever before. This saw the addition of Shang-Chi who was one of the first picks for this new Avengers initiative. In terms of the MCU, he is already set to star in his own solo film called Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Ultimate Red Skull. Making his debut in the Ultimate Comics Avengers 1 back in 2009, Ultimate Red Skull is a lot different than the Red Skull casual moviegoers would have guessed at this point. See the son of Steve Rogers, yes, and Gail Richards. They even hid him and trained him to become the next Captain America. It's wild. The Ultimates are wild. He always feared that he would never live up to his father's expectations. I mean, fair. At just age 17, he killed all the doctors and soldiers at the military base. He was in charge and his side hustle was planning this badass escape in the meantime. He then got the haunting look by using a kitchen knife and carving his head. So. That's disgusting. Nice, gross way to kick off this list. And before we continue on to number nine, guys, if you could go ahead and Hulk smash that like button because it really helps us out here at the studio. You guys are the best. Now back to the list. Coming in at number nine, we have Lyra. Taking place on Earth 8009, beginning with Hulk Raging Thunder issue one. We find Lyra Walters, or sometimes referred to as Savage She-Hulk. She is the daughter of Thundra and Earth 616 Hulk. So yeah, she's from Earth 8009 in the 23rd century, and at that time the Earth was split into different factions, right? So the guys' faction were like warriors, they looked up to like past heroes. Then the women came together under the United Sisterhood Republic, and they were outgunned and outmanned, like literally outmanned. So Thundra got sent to Earth, our Earth 616, where she met our Hulk, and had a baby. How cute. Lyra actually gets stronger when she's calm, and she's able to tap into 
the gamma site, which means she can see the flow of gamma radiation. I'm doing my best interpretation of gamma radiation. Can't see the green, but it's a lot of gamma behind me. So she becomes a smarter and smoother fighter in this state. But if she becomes angry, she'll actually become weaker, which is fun. Let's play with that idea of it. Number eight, Ultron. In the MCU, Tony and Bruce are the masterminds behind Ultron. But in the comics, it was actually Hank Pym. See, Ultron made his first debut back in 1968 in Avengers 54. And beneath the crimson cowl, we discover is indeed Ultron Pym. I love how in Age of Ultron, they used a red cowl to hide his new and improved look. It was a nice reveal. In the comics, Hank Pym was actually the father of Ultron. So there's been many versions of Ultron seeing as he constantly wants to upgrade himself and be bigger, badder, and bolder. He actually has the same brain patterns as Hank Pym. He figured it needed a personality, much like our MCU version of Ultron is basically Tony Stank, but with more, you know, metal, rage, fire, and blood, and horrible, horribleness. Number seven, Franklin Richards. Born in New York City, Franklin Richards, of course being the son of Reed Richards and Susan Storm, is quoted from Galactus himself as the most powerful mutant ever. Nice, that's it, put that on a resume. Boop, that's sick. He is a mutant beyond Omega power. You heard it from Big Guns himself. See, Franklin was a member of Gen X, and he's also a future X-Men member in the Ultimate X-Men comics. Some of his powers include vast reality warping, psionic powers, he also has control over the universe, so awesome. He's got precognitive powers, so his dreams tip him off on what's gonna happen in real life. That happens to me, except it's always embarrassing, and they end up happening. He can see the future in his dreams. That's so OP. He can resurrect the dead, he can time travel, teleport, astral project, and he can duplicate planets and or people. So yeah, ego, living planet. You're doomed either way, pal. At a young age, he was able to create a pocket universe, and then in Fantastic Four issue 604, this dude even took on not one, not two, but three celestials. One of them he actually just took out with one punch. One punch, man. One punch, man. Huh. Needless to say, Franklin Richards is not somebody you want to mess with in any of his pocket universes. Franklin has a middle name, and that's Benjamin, which is nice because they named him after their good pal, Ben Grimm, the thing. My middle name's Douglas. Number six, Red She-Hulk. So this mysterious character just showed up when the Red Hulk gathered a team to hunt down Domino. So while Wolverine was fighting Red Hulk, he like scratched his eyes out, which is a mess. And then just as Wolverine was about to finish him off, Bam, Red She-Hulk comes in to save the day and she's fierce, like right off the bat, she taunts Wolverine by showing him her fancy new outfit that used to belong to Domino. Like she had Domino's gun, she had Electra's Psy, and then she bragged about how she killed the two and took their weapons and clothes. So she's kind of a hot mess. She held off the fight long enough for Red Hulk to recuperate and then unbeknownst to Red Hulk until later on, the identity of the new mysterious Red Badass is actually none other than Betty Ross. General Ross became the Red Hulk and was an Avenger at one point. So his daughter, Betty, naturally also became the Red She-Hulk. Now, I know what I said about her earlier it makes her sound like an absolute savage. In some of these comics, yeah, she is. She even killed the Hulk in Incredible Hulk 634. So you gotta check more of her out. Her powers are pretty nuts. During the scrap with Wolverine, she spat in his face, which is yucky, first of all. We don't do that anymore. Six feet apart, people. But secondly, her saliva is acid. So she grabbed Red Hulk and they both ducked out in the sewers while wow, his eyes melted. Yuck. Number five, Stinger, AKA Cassie Lang. This one I think we actually might see in the MCU sooner than we think, so yes. The daughter of Scott Lang, AKA Ant-Man, is one of my favorite parts of the Ant-Man films. She's so cute, she's funny, the way they interact, it's just good, it's a nice father-daughter relationship that we kinda saw with Morgan and Tony, but it was just nicer and this lasted much longer. <sighs> So in the comics, she actually took over for her father after his death in Avengers Disassembled. Now, I don't think Paul Rudd's gonna leave the MCU anytime soon, but if slash when he does, I think they've shown enough growth of Cassie Lang, literally, that they can have her suit up now. I mean, who knows, maybe after he supposedly blipped, Cassie wanted to like avenge him and stuff. We didn't really see a lot of that side. Even in the comics, she was asked by Scarlet Witch to join the Young Avengers. Then she donned the name, <clears throat> then she donned the name Stinger after she died and came back to life. Now, while I don't think this exactly is gonna happen anytime soon in the movies, I'm getting an idea that she works alongside Scott Lang in the next movie, that's my prediction. See, Scott watched Hank and Hope play catch up during this franchise. She practically begged him to get her own suit, but Hank's like, 
no, or you know, Michael Douglas said no like a thousand times, he yelled a lot too. Scott probably saw this and knew it was gonna happen eventually with him and Cassie, right? So we had that little time jump in Endgame, now we've got an older Cassie in a world that's pretty dangerous. Maybe we'll see it, maybe we won't. Maybe it's Maybelline. And number four, Valeria Richards. The second child, as you would have guessed, by Reed Richards and Susan Storm. She made her debut in Fantastic Four, Volume 3, Issue 54. Valeria is also so badass like her brother. She may not be as powerful as her brother, you know, with the whole Omega level pocket universe jazz, but she's super smart, smarter than her dad, even. Pretty sick. She's also more into working alongside her uncle, Victor Von Doom. He's always the cool uncle everybody loves, you know? Can't help it, just too cool. Hashtag too cool for school. She believes that Reed also never really used his knowledge to help people. Rather, he just did things for himself, which is a common theme in superhero worlds. Donning the nickname Brainstorm in the meantime, hopefully we get to see her sometime soon. Number three, Scotty Summers. Making his debut in Mutant X issue one back in 1998, Scotty Summers is the son of Avengers member Havoc and Madeline Pryor. The Inferno event is probably the most noted piece of his history. See, they wanted to use Scotty Summers as a sacrifice in order to open up a portal to the Goblin Force. Madeline saved him, but in doing so, she became possessed by the Goblin Queen. This was when he showed his true power. That power just happens to be up there with Franklin Richards. Celestial level, baby. He's the best. He has soul sense empathy, so he has the ability to sense the goodness in others without even touching them. And on top of that, he can read minds, so it doesn't matter how you feel or think, Scotty already knows. And Psionic Firebird is pretty wild too. He can turn it to a psychic firebird whose claws can harm you physically and or mentally. Nice. Number two, Vision. The son of Iron Man and Banner. In Captain America Civil War, we see the fallout of Tony and Cap begin. See, after creating an evil robot son who wants nothing but destruction, Tony figures, well, maybe if I make another one, the new body and mind stone will kind of be good. And it did, it was pretty sweet, and he kicks ass. Vision started out as his android that belonged to Tony Stark. And then by time Infinity War, Banner says the line, you lost another super bot? And then Tony responds with, I didn't lose him, he's evolving. So this is an interesting time in the MCU. Vision is like the son of Iron Man. And then after we lost him, I knew there would be more. Even in this poster, there's a glitch, a little speck of color left in it. In Infinity Gauntlet, we see a colorless Vision after he meets a similar demise. So when that poster was released, I figured there was a part of him that was downloaded and left somewhere because Marvel doesn't just make printing errors. I don't know why we didn't look into this more. So with WandaVision releasing on Disney Plus next year, this could become reality. Who knows where the baby Avenger will end up, but I'm excited and also very nervous. Please be okay. And finally at number one, we got Scar. Making his debut in World War Hulk issue five, he was conceived during the Planet Hulk storyline. He's a son of Hulk and Kyra the Old Strong. After Hulk had spent time on Sakaar, he also started spending a little bit of alone time, you know? So after Hulk had left the planet, Sakaar had popped out of a cocoon and he resembled a teenager after just a year. So, growing pretty fast. Now given the fact he was born to a not so chill planet, he learned to kill like it was a normal thing. Well he needed to kill for survival. Eventually, he ends up on Axeman Bone's radar. So Scar retains the old power as well. So he has the ability to control tectonic energy, like summon lava and magma, and he can also tap into energy projection. Out of the many children of the Hulk, Scar easily, easily takes the top of that list. And also the top of this list as well, because he's here, so. There it is. In a 10, Ultron 1320. Ultron 1320 comes to us from Earth 14622 and What If Age of Ultron number one. An Earth where thanks to Wasp dying, Ultron is able to take over the world faster. Ultron was created to be the ultimate AI by Hank Pym to help the Avengers utilize their function better as a team. But with the untimely death of Pym's wife, Pym went on to create a more brutal version of Ultron, which was to replace the Avengers, which makes him technically the son of Hank Pym. So he's viable for this list, okay? But since he's a robot, I'm putting him at the top, don't worry, that's why he's here. But with this, Ultron's sentience began to constantly evolve and he started the eradication of the human race by taking out such threats as the Avengers and the Defenders while he left Pym alive to just watch everyone suffer. Ultron and his army of Ultron Sentinels then moved to Kola, Russia so he could bore himself into the planet's core to create the ultimate version of himself, Ultron 1320. Ultron then had his minions batter and beat Pym unconscious until he woke up to find himself 
turn into Ultron 1321. This version also invaded other worlds, claiming Earth 62412, 23223, and 81223, but before being stopped on Earth 45162. That's a lot of numbers. And at 9, Wiccan. Billy Kaplan, also known by his superhero aliases as Guardian and Wiccan, is a superpowered warlock and the reincarnated son of the Scarlet Witch. He has spent time on numerous superhero teams, including the Young Avengers and the New Avengers, and after Wiccan's powers overloaded during a battle with the Sons of the Serpent, the Avengers decided to keep him under observation. Hulkling and the other Young Avengers broke Wiccan out of holding and began to search for the Scarlet Witch. Accompanied by Magneto and Quicksilver, the team traveled to Transia and then to Latveria before discovering a depowered and amnesiac Wanda engaged to Doctor Doom. The rediscovery of Wanda did not go unnoticed though as the Avengers soon arrived on the scene. Iron Lad teleported the young Avengers and Wanda into the time stream and they all went into the past and met a reanimated Jack of Hearts who was about to explode. After that Wanda remembered who she was, regained her powers and returned herself, the young Avengers and Scott Lang to the present. She then finally confirmed that Billy and Tommy were indeed her reincarnated sons. A story that seemingly will be adapted into the MCU come Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. In a date, Hulkling. Teddy was one of the first people in the Avengers failsafe program, compiled by the Vision, to be used as a form of new team of superheroes in the event of the destruction or the disbandment of the Avengers. Iron Lad, a younger version of Kang the Conqueror, found Teddy using the Vision's failsafe program and requested his help in preventing his future self from returning to the future. Teddy joined the Young Avengers and adopted the superhero identity of the Hulkling, despite actually being the son of Captain Marvel. He only took on the Hulkling identity to help keep in the theme of the Young Avengers being new versions of the original Avengers, using his powers to change his skin color to green. As well as these shape-shifting abilities comes the powers of flight, a healing factor, as well as superhuman stamina, durability, and strength. He also gains the ability of matter substitution when he and his husband Wiccan end up using their wedding rings together, which is kind of adorable and goals. And it's seven, Scotty Summers. Hailing from Earth 1298, Scotty is Alex Summers and Madeline Pryor's son. Scotty, as he came to be known, was born to the mutant superhero Havoc and his then girlfriend Madeline. Sometime after his birth, his mom and dad got married and they moved in with the reformed X Factor. As a child, he showed no signs of exceptional power and enjoyed a normal life until the Inferno event. During Inferno, he was captured by a couple demons who planned to use him as a sacrifice to open up the world to the malevolent goblin force. Alone and afraid, he was rescued by his mother Madeline. Madeline, who brokered a deal with the demons in exchange for her son's life. He returned home with her and the demons and the nightmare it seemed were over. But when Havoc of Earth 616 wound up in his counterpart in the Mutant X's reality's dead body, Scott immediately recognized that this Havoc was not truly his father. This was the first hint at the scope of young Scotty's power. When his mother was possessed by the Goblin Queen, Scotty was also taken by his father and their nanny, the ninja assassin Electra. The three became like a family themselves and Scotty even bonded with his new father. Eventually, Scotty during the battle was captured along with Havoc by the evil entity, but he knew that he was in the right place at the right time, and incidentally knew exactly what to do to end the fight. With a simple touch, he managed to defeat the Goblin Queen, who was possessing his mother at the time. But yeah, it's pretty overpowered. I guess you could say that uh, Scotty doesn't know about his powers. And it's six, Vision. The MCU Vision is in essence the son of Tony Stark, Bruce Banner, Ultron, and Thor, which is honestly a really weird combination. Or if you want to get more technical, I guess Thor and Ultron are closer to his parents, with like Tony and Bruce basically being his grandparents, aside from the whole using Jarvis to make Vision thing. So I guess technically, by that logic, Tony is also Vision's father and grandfather. What? <laughs> Either way, powered by an advanced AI and the Mind Stone, Vision is probably one of the most powerful events Avengers until he was killed in Infinity War at the hands of Wanda and then Thanos. Which was a stupid idea as we saw thanks to Ultron Z's with Thanos in the What If series on Disney Plus. Where using the Mind Stone, Ultron just literally tore Thanos in half. Which is probably what Vision could have done, resulting in one of the most frustrating moments of the entire MCU to me. But oh well, what are you gonna do? But yeah, I think that with the Mind Stone he is certainly powerful, but his reluctance to use it to kill Thanos puts him higher on the list. As well as, you know, the whole being mostly dead thing. 
Number 5. Ghost Rider While Starbrand might have the greatest potential for power, and we aren't sure entirely what she's capable of just yet, Robbie Reyes is a bit more experienced when it comes to his powers. And even when he was less experienced, he actually accidentally killed one of the previous Starbrands, Kevin Connor, in Marvel Legacy. So for those reasons, I thought we should give him a bit of a boost when it comes to his ranking on this list. Robbie Reyes first appeared in the comic scene in 2014 in all new Ghost Rider issue number one. He is an all new Ghost Rider, just like the series claims. During a street race gone wrong, Robbie was killed and ended up possessed by the ghost who haunted the car that he was driving, becoming the new Ghost Rider. He joined up with the Avengers recently in the comics, and I think he makes a great addition to the team. I personally love Robbie Reyes, so yeah, I'm here for it. Number 4. Winter Hulk While Jennifer Walters as She-Hulk may have joined the Avengers long ago, first joining up back in the 80s, she has gone through a a lot of changes since then. One recent and major one which also returned her to her smaller, smarter, more playful and sassy yet still very powerful form happened recently in Avengers Comics. For a brief time, She-Hulk, then known as Just Hulk, ended up becoming Winter Hulk. Winter Hulk happened as a result of Jen allowing herself to be kidnapped by the Winter Guard of Russia to try and figure out what they were up to, what devious things are they planning. In the end, they attempted to mind wipe and brainwash Hulk to turn her her into one of their agents. And uh, they kind of succeeded. Although the process was interrupted, for a brief time Jen acted as their agent, Winter Hulk. However, as Winter Hulk, Jen still managed to fight against her programming, and alert her fellow Avengers when sent to attack Namor and Atlantis. In the end, Winter Hulk was forced to absorb a ton of radiation to protect the citizens of Atlantis. She managed to discharge the gamma radiation she had absorbed safely, and as a result was returned to her original form, ultimately deciding to retire from the Avengers team after these events and return to practicing law. And now we have a new She-Hulk series that I have heard nothing but good things about. I really need to get reading my first issue. <laughs> Number 3. Phoenix While Phoenix is definitely one of the most powerful superheroes to be on the Avengers team, her history with them is a bit more lengthy than you might initially think which is why I ranked her a little bit lower on this list than I normally would. Phoenix herself was back on the original Avengers team, the prehistoric Avengers, or the Avengers of 1 million BC. This avatar for Phoenix was known as Firehair. However, Firehair only made her first appearance even in 2017 in the comics. So she's also kind of new in a way, even though she's super old. Does that make sense? Maya Lopez, aka Echo, is the current host of the Phoenix Force and the current Phoenix, who also finds herself on the Avengers team. Her being Phoenix is new, but her being on the Avengers team is not new. She rejoined the team in 2021 as Phoenix, which is quite new, like I said, but she actually was a member of the Avengers way back in 2005, when she was using the mantle of Ronin. Still, Maya being Phoenix and being part of the Avengers altogether is quite fresh right now, despite both the Phoenix Force's history with the prehistoric team and Maya's own history with the present day team. And of course, Phoenix is one of the most powerful entities in the entire Marvel Universe. So despite her being kind of a new, old combo thing, we have to show respect to the blazingly brilliant and powerful Maya Lopez, aka Echo, aka Phoenix, on this list. Number 2. Cable Nathan Summers ended up joining the Avengers team at a time when Captain America was seeking to present a show of unity. Hence, Cable ended up being on the Avengers Unity Division, which was meant to bring together Avengers and X-Men after events of Avengers vs X-Men had created tension between the two superhero groups of Earth. Series-wise, the team was known as the Uncanny Avengers, with Cable joining up as early as issue number 4. Cable is an extremely powerful telepath and telekinetic due to him being the offspring of X-Men member Cyclops and his wife at the time, Mr. Sinister created clone of Jean Grey, Madeline Pryor. Despite Maddie being his birth mother, Jean has also been like a mother to Nate after she was implanted with the memories of basically raising him, making her kind of like his telepathically retcon mom, with Maddie becoming more like a surrogate mother in terms of her relationship with Nate, formerly known to her as Baby Christopher. 
Oh baby Christopher. Number one, Avenger Prime. Avenger Prime is kind of like all of the Avengers merged together. At least, that's what the original version of this character was like. They made their first appearance in the 2013 Mighty Avengers series, but another character with that name also recently reappeared in the 2021 free comic book day Avengers and Hulk comic. They showed up in the Avengers portion of that double feature story comic. Here, Avengers Prime is the leader of the Deathlock Avengers forces, who basically stands guard at the God Quarry, seeking to watch, protect, and warn against major multiversal threats and potential chronal collapses. Presumably, this is some version of Avenger Prime that decided to stay omnipotent and bonded together. At least that's what I'm assuming. Some people are assuming different things. When we saw Avenger Prime last, or an alternate version of them, if you will, they were created using a ritual which allowed the team of Mighty Avengers to bond together. Technically, Avenger Prime stands to be the most powerful of the Avengers, as they should be made up of one or more teams or rosters potentially combined together. Now, of course, some people believe that Avenger Prime is actually some sort of alternate version or uh, some future version of Tony Stark, aka Iron Man. But we don't really know for sure yet. Whoever they are, though, they definitely seem to have a lot of time, a lot of power, and a lot of resources on their hands. Especially for being a shadowy figure. Coming in at number 10, we have Jerry Drew. Jessica Drew otherwise known as Spider Woman, decided that she would take a break from trying to save the world and focus on building up a family. Well, it turns out the world wanted that to be hard for her too. After the baby was born, it was extremely sick. Since spider people normally get their powers from an irradiated spider, just like Jessica did, they have irradiated blood. This exposure to radiation caused her baby to be very sick, and doctors couldn't find any way to help out the poor boy. This left everything up to Spider Woman to try and fix the problem. She came up with a cure for her own powers in hopes that this would cure her son of this horrible sickness and turns out that it unlocked all of his spider abilities. But unfortunately this didn't cure him from being incredibly ill. But he could still survive with his new found strength. He would later become Spider Boy, a young whippersnapper addition to the spider family. Coming in at number 9 we have Thunderstrike. Eric Masterson was a powerful hero known as Thunderstrike. He was the wielder of a powerful Asgardian weapon and in some ways it was similar to Mjolnir, but he would follow the sad fate that some heroes are met with, and that is of course dying. In the time of him missing Thunderstrike's son, Kevin Masterson would step in as the new hero that everyone needed, and in this time he would have the added edge that his father didn't. The Valkyrie, Grunhilda, would come down to Earth to teach the young hero how to use his mighty weapon so he wouldn't end up the same way that his father did. Kevin, running around now as Thunderstrike, would be able to become such a powerful hero that there was a time when Thor was nowhere to be found and Kevin stepped in to fill his spot. That's pretty gnarly. You have to be one bad dude to be able to come in and take the spot of the God of Thunder. Of course, when Thor came back, he was like, sorry kid, but I'm the only God of Thunder around here. And guys, make sure you hit that like button because it really helps us out is Modi Thorson. When you're one of the most powerful gods to ever walk the Nine Realms, there are going to be a few people who want to have a baby with you. When Thor was trapped in Hell, he wanted to get out and the goddess Hela said she would do it, but for a price. And she wanted Thor to give her a baby. And Thor thought this deal wasn't half bad, so he agreed to impregnate Hela in order to be released from Hell. This all went off without a hitch, and then after a few weeks, a child just showed up in Asgard, and Thor didn't really know what to do with this kid, and there was a massive war that was about to kick off with the children of tomorrow. So Thor didn't have time to protect a kid, teach a kid, and fight off the children of tomorrow. So Thor did what any good dad would do and locked his son away in a room with Mjolnir. That way when he was worthy he would be able to break out of the room that he was locked away in. Seems like a smart parenting plan. So time flowed faster in the room, so after a couple weeks Modi Thorson was a full grown man and could now wield Mjolnir. He burst out of the room, he hated his dad, and then he tried to destroy America to build a new Asgard, and he had some pretty intense magical powers. Coming at number 7, we have X-23. No, technically not a child. Wolverine didn't impregnate someone to 
to make X-23, but he has definitely raised her as a daughter and he has an emotional attachment to her as if she was his own flesh and blood, which she is just not in the traditional sense. X-23 is of course the clone of Wolverine who was built for one reason and one reason only, to be a tool of death. She has Wolverine's same powers and has been trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat in ways that rival even Wolverine himself. She also constantly struggles with the fact that she was made as a weapon. The people who made her see her as property and can use her for whatever nefarious purposes they want, but of course Laura Kinney, also known as X-23, is a person and doesn't want to be treated like someone's property. I don't know if the people making her ever thought that she would take after her father. Like maybe it was a bad idea to clone the dude who you tried to turn into a weapon before and then rebelled against you and has been fighting against you ever since he escaped. Who would have thought that his clone would do pretty much the exact same thing? Coming in at number 6 we have Hope Summers. The aptly named Hope was the first mutant to make it into existence after the world was hit with the tragic event known as M-Day. This of course was the day that nearly all of the mutants were wiped from Earth and it would seem that no mutant would ever be born again. Once this girl was alive she showed immense levels of power. She was able to bust Rogue out of a coma and it would seem that this new mutant would be the target for everyone who either wanted mutants dead or who wanted to direct the future of mutant kind. So Cable takes the child to the future where she can grow up in secret and train with one of the greatest warriors of all time. She would later come back with a strong understanding of her powers. Hope Summers has the ability to mimic other mutants powers and even use them more powerful than the original host. So she basically has the power to show you up at your own game. She'd be like, oh yeah, you have eye lasers? Well, I'll just beat you at your own game with these eye lasers that are even stronger than yours. Hope is also an Omega level mutant and some think that she could be responsible for the dystopian future that so many of the time travelers are afraid of. Coming in at number 5 we have James Hudson Jr. Well it turns out that getting another super healing mutant with claws and bloodlust that can't be matched can be created in more ways than just cloning. James Hudson Jr. is the son of Wolverine and this guy is a badass. This was a little bit of a sneaky move pulled off by the spy Magda. She stole a serum that would guarantee that a baby would come out as a mutant. She then juiced herself up with the serum and then found Wolverine and the two got hot and heavy. Magda got pregnant and once she gave birth to a baby she found Wolverine and was like hey dude here's her kid and left the kid with Wolverine. And I think it's safe to say that Wolverine wouldn't be the best dad ever which I think he even knows about himself. So Wolverine found an old war buddy James Hudson and he left the baby with him for him and his wife to raise. When James Hudson Jr. was finally old enough his powers revealed themselves and it turned out he was just like his daddy. From there it was a little harder to keep the secret about who his daddy actually was and then we start to get some conflicts between Wolverine and his angsty son. Coming in at number 4 we have Photon, the son of Captain Marvel and one of the most dangerous beings that has ever been brought into the Marvel Universe. Photon has bounced around through a few different phases as a hero. He started off as trying to figure out who he was under the banner legacy. Then he even took the mantle of Captain Marvel for a bit but eventually he came into his final form of Photon and it would seem that this form was so powerful it could warp reality itself and his physical form was so strong that there would never be anything that could destroy him. But it turns out that the Thunderbolts had to find a way to destroy him because Photon couldn't control his powers and this was going to lead to reality being ripped apart as it occasionally does in comic books. Basically what happened was Photon was constantly pulling energy into his body without the ability to slow this down. So the Thunderbolts actually had to find a way to dismember him and move his separate body parts into different realities so his body wouldn't bring the end of time and space. It's kind of a bummer for him because he really just wanted to be a good guy. Coming at number 3 we have Kashamba, Black Panther's grandson in one of the most hectic universes that has ever been created in Marvel. For those of you who don't know, Kashamba exists in the Marvel Zombies universe where people are constantly ripping at each other's throats to try and survive. Kashamba had to watch his grandfather, Black Panther, get turned into a zombie to survive. This obviously scares the hell out of the boy and things get even crazier when the new king takes over Wakanda and then tries to have Black Panther killed. I think it's safe to say that this kid won't grow up well adjusted. Nothing like the mental scarring of your grandfather becoming a zombie and then having an entire nation that you were supposed to inherit try to kill him. Also, later in this comic series, the brain of Steve Rogers gets implanted into Kashamba's body. Things just fly off the handle in this universe. I mean the people on Earth 616 thought that they had it rough, but there are way crazier things waiting out for you out in the multiverse. Coming in at number 2 we have Hulkling. He is the product of forbidden love and his origin actually has very little to do with the Hulk surprisingly. So Teddy Kaplan Altman was living on Earth not thinking that anything strange was going to happen. But 
but one day he's approached by a super scroll who starts telling him that he's part of an alien race and he needs to go to space. Whoa, that's a lot for a kid to take in. Later, it's revealed that the lady that he thought was his mom was actually a scroll, but not his mother. She's a scroll that was sent to Earth with him to protect him. Then it's revealed that his actual mother is a scroll princess and his father is a Kree warrior known as the Avenger Captain Marvel. For those of you who don't know, the Kree and the Skrull hate each other, so this is a Romeo and Juliet scenario. Well, the two sides start fighting over who should have custody rights over this mixed alien kid who thought he was a human, and they decide on joint custody. He'll spend half his life with the Kree and the other half with the Skrull, but a Skrull takes his place so he can stay on Earth. This storyline has more plot twists than an episode of Days of Our Lives. Now, outside of this crazy backstory, Hulkling has super strength and the power to shapeshift. He mimics the Hulk's powers and can shift his powers into so many other forms. In a 10, Ian Rogers. When Steve Rogers got trapped in Dimension Z, he rescued a baby boy while he was trapped there. Since time moves faster in that dimension though, he ended up raising the boy for over 10 years. Sharon Carter ended up raising him for the remainder of his childhood when she was also trapped in Dimension Z after going there to rescue Steve. The boy was the son of Armin Zola, but he saw Steve Rogers and Sharon Carter as his parents. His birth name was Leopold Zola, but he goes by Ian Rogers now. The name that his true father gave him. By the time he left Dimension Z, Ian was a full grown adult. He then took on the name Nomad and partnered with Sam Wilson. And in 9, Francis Barton. On Earth 555-326, also known as the next Avengers Heroes of Tomorrow universe, Francis Barton was Clint Barton's son, who raised him to be a hero and helped the rebels known as the Scavengers, and Francis led them around Machine City after his father's death. When the children of the other deceased Avengers, James Rogers, Torin, Hank Pym Jr., and Osri arrived, he saved them from Ultron's forces. And James and his siblings followed Francis and the Scavengers to their home base. He told them that he was the surviving son of the original Hawkeye. Then Francis became infuriated when he realized that he wasn't the last Avenger, and angrily wondered the whereabouts of the others during his time of desperate survival. James reasoned that they didn't know of his existence, much like their fathers did, and James, the son of Captain America, and Francis often argued. At first he seemed cold and indifferent to his new friends, but as time passed, he showed himself to be just as much of a jokester and a flirt as Clint ever was. Which is kind of weird because they're kids. And at 8, Katie Summers. After the Earth was destroyed by a Celestial, survivors moved into another planet. Here, Havoc and Wasp get married and have a child, Catherine Summers. However, she was born a human, not a mutant, and thus would be subjected to persecution in an all-mutant world. Consequently, her existence was kept secret to only her parents and her godfather, Hank McCoy. Years later, Kang appeared and forced Havoc to follow his plan by taking Katie away. Given her connection to the alpha-level mutant Havoc, though, if they ever decided to retcon Katie, we can guess that at some point she'd develop a similar power set to Havoc. So if they ever decide to retcon her, she'll be pretty powerful. <laughs> Havoc absorbs ambient cosmic energy into his cells of his body and processes it into plasma. This results in control over an extremely powerful sort of destructive force. And at times he's not entirely able to control this ability, which sometimes makes him a danger to those around him unless he wears a special containment suit to assist him. Havoc's body is also constantly in the process of absorbing cosmic radiation, so he can basically do it whenever. And given that superhero kids Kids are usually more powerful than their parents. If they ever decide to retcon her, this is gonna be scary, okay? Look, I know that she's a human, but sometimes humans are the most powerful beings. She's also number eight, so chill. And it's seven, Osri T'Challa. Osri is the son of Black Panther and Storm. He was taken to safety by Iron Man with, along with James Rogers, Torin, and Henry Pym Jr. to keep them all safe from Ultron. Osri, along with his other siblings, only knew of the Avengers through Tony's tales of their former glory days. And as the son of the Black Panther and Storm, Osri inherited their powers and abilities of the harp-shaped herb from his father, enhanced speed, agility, strength, endurance, healing, and senses. He also inherited the powers and abilities of electrokinesis from his mother. One day while he was playing hide seek with Pym, the vision arrives at the refuge. Tony tells everyone to wait in James's room until he tells them otherwise. While Asri is fine with waiting, the others aren't, and he fails at convincing them to wait as Tony instructed. When he failed, he and his siblings found a secret entrance to a repair bay under their parents' grave markers. As they searched, they found a room full of Iron Man-style robots who resembled each of their parents. While James and Torin lingered, Asri and Pym kept moving and managed to find Tony and the strange robot which is actually the vision. And then all the Avenger robots end up waking up and then they go to fight Ultron as their programming intended. So then there's a whole kerfuffle. It's when they meet Francis Barton. And it's six Torrin. 
On Earth 555-326, Torrin was the daughter of Thor and Sif. Torrin was taken to safety by Tony Stark alongside the other children to keep them safe from Ultron. And Torrin, like the others, only knew of the Avengers through Tony's stories. She could oftentimes be both arrogant and prideful, but I mean, so could her father. But she has become humble through the learning and of the coping with her mortality, because she is actually mortal. After the arrival of the Vision, Torrin and her siblings got too curious for their own good and revealed the secret entrance, which I just explained. While with James, she found the Iron Avengers, and then they accidentally activated their robots, and their automatic programming sent them to intercept Ultron, in which the Iron Avengers attacked. But the Iron Avengers were assimilated by Ultron, so that's gonna be fun. Look, she may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but at least she's powerful. She's Thor's daughter. Halfway through in at number 5, Valeria Richards. Valeria Richards is the second son of Dr. Reed Richards, aka Mr. Fantastic, and Susan Richards, aka the Invisible Woman, who did serve as Avengers for a couple missions. Due to her parents being exposed to cosmic radiation and being conceived in the negative zone, it caused her birth to be traumatic. But thanks to her uncle, Dr. Doom, he saved her life using a combination of science and magic. She was born a standard human and developed a genius level intellect like her father. But as an unborn infant, when she was approaching term, she began to emit bursts of deadly radiation radiation that threatened both her and her mother. Despite bringing in fellow scientists and radiation experts like Bruce Banner, Michael Morbius, and Otto Octavius, Reed Richards was unable to save his daughter, who appeared to be stillborn. Appearances can be deceiving though. Franklin Richards, the couple's first child, felt a deep loss over his sister because, you know, he didn't have a sister anymore. Unconsciously, though, he secretly used his psionic powers to transport this daughter to an alternate reality. After Franklin's cosmic powers were depleted during a battle to save all reality, Valeria reverted to an unborn child within Sue's womb. So all of a sudden, she was pregnant with Valeria again. Yeah, Sue then came to term, but again her life was threatened by bursts of radiation from the child. However, this time Johnny Storm enlisted the aid of Doctor Doom, who was able to save her, but not without a price. And at 4, Modi Thorson. In the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610, when Thor traveled to Valhalla to retrieve the soul of Valkyrie, Hela appeared and told him if he managed to defeat her army that she would revive Valkyrie, but for a price. Thor remained in Valhalla once Valkyrie was revived, but when he requested to be sent back to Earth, Hela once again agreed, but for a price. This time, though, it was a child. Thor agreed. Well, meanwhile, on Earth, Amora showed Valkyrie a vision of Thor and Hela making love. <laughs> Valkyrie didn't realize that he had to do it, though to get back to Earth, but whatever. Thor, after the deed, asked to be sent back to Earth, but Hela requested another price. In a rage, Thor drew his sword and was going to kill Hela before seeing that she was already pregnant. The child, named Modi, eventually joined with the Children of Tomorrow, and when the Children of Tomorrow invaded Asgard, Thor locked Modi in a room without doors to keep him safe, and gave him Mjolnir so that when he was worthy, he would have a way out. Weeks later, but in that room it was years, and after the children had destroyed Washington, an adult Modi broke free of the room, with Mjolnir in his hand. Disguised as the mysterious Mr. Moras, Modi attempted to usher in another American Civil War by supporting various warring factions in America in order to destroy the country and create a new Asgard from its ashes. He eventually was killed by Thor after using the Mind Stone to control Thor's mind and siding with Hydra, so uh, yeah, not a good kid overall, but still pretty damn powerful. In at 3, Red She-Hulk. A mysterious female version of Red Hulk first appeared when the Red Hulk had gathered a team of mercenaries to hunt down Domino. After this group, called Code Red, not sponsored by Mountain Dew, found Domino, Wolverine slashed his claws across Red Hulk's face, blinding him until his healing factor restored his eyesight. Wolverine was about to deliver the killing blow to Red Hulk when Red She-Hulk appeared, blindsiding him. Red She-Hulk protected Red Hulk long enough in challenging Wolverine. However, just as Red Hulk began to trust Red She-Hulk, she double-crossed him and plunged Elektra's stolen sigh into his neck. Code Red were gathered in the sewers and awaited orders from Samson. Their encounter ended with Red She-Hulk kicking Red Hulk off the Empire State Building. She was then captured by Hank Pym, but her identity was finally revealed when she was stabbed with a sword by Scar and reverted to her human form, revealing her to be Betty, Thaddeus Ross, aka Red Hulk's daughter. And Red She-Hulk has gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hulk in a battle that resulted in both of them dying before being brought back by a wish that Hulk had made earlier so yeah, pretty powerful. See, I know if someone has tussled with the Hulk to put him higher on this list now since y'all can't let go. But ultimately, and in number two, Scar. Scar was the progeny of Hulk and Ciara the Old Strong. 
After Ciara's death, I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, a cocoon containing Scar fell into the lake of fire. After a period of time, Scar emerged from this cocoon, appearing to be the age of a human boy. A year later, he appeared to have grown into a young adult and spent time in the swamps with old Sam, who attempted to raise, teach, and guide him after he discovered him shortly after the shadow people burned tattoos into his skin. It took old Sam months to get him to wear a loincloth and speak, although to be fair, it would have also taken him a few months to get me to wear a loincloth. As the son of the Hulk though, Scar presumably possesses the capacity for vast, if not limitless levels of physical strength among other capabilities. Ones which are either fueled by intense anger like his father or via channeling the old power. Once having absorbed a hundred trillion tons of kinetic energy from a city to fight the Hulk, he sent Juggernaut flying into space with ease, punching beings miles away, just a lot. And not only that, but thanks to his mother, Scar also possesses the powers of the shadow people known as the old power, which allows him to connect to and manipulate the planet's energies, basically giving him lava and earth bending skills. Finally, in at number one, Franklin Richards. Franklin Richards is the son of Reed and Sue Richards of the world-renowned Fantastic Four, who like I said, were at one point working alongside the Avengers, and who were deemed Avengers for a couple missions, so I'm counting it. Basically, the freaking Celestials have deemed this kid to be beyond Omega level on the scale of mutant-based powers, so... Yeah. A future version of Franklin came back to our present and managed to bend Galactus to his will, making Galactus Franklin's herald. Which I think speaks for itself. This kid is able to tear the universe apart with a th single thought, probably making him the scariest damn toddler on the face of this planet. And that's coming from someone who already thinks toddlers are scary, okay? You should have seen that one kid who tried to stab me with safety scissors. It was certainly an interesting Tuesday afternoon. And in the book History of the Marvel Universe, Franklin Richards is revealed to apparently survive the end of his universe and pass on to the next one, like Galactus did, which is freaking insane. Coming in at number one, we have Wiccan. You know if you're the son of both Scarlet Witch and Vision, you're gonna have some pretty serious powers. But Wiccan didn't even know that he was the baby of two of the greatest heroes of all time. Eventually, he met up with the young Avenger Speed, and he realized that the two of them are brothers. Eventually, it's revealed who his real parents are, and they should have known because they all have very similar powers. Wiccan can fly, use magic, alter reality, create force fields, teleport, communicate through the mind, and control things with his mind. And if he's anything like his mama, he might end up being one of the strongest superhumans to ever be on planet Earth. We should probably get this kid into some therapy right now, and everyone should be super nice to him. We don't need another M-Day event happening. You know how everything got screwed up and reality was shifted forever. Number 10, Ava Ayala. From her introduction in the comics, Ava Ayala was pretty much always involved with the Avengers. She possesses the White Tiger Amulet, which grants her her powers. She enrolled in the Avengers Academy and was later declared an official Avengers member during her time with Luke Cage's Mighty Avengers in Volume 2 of the series named after the team during the Infinity Event. Fun fact, if you exclude Doc Ock's Superior Spider-Man, the Mighty Avengers would be considered to be an all-black superhero team. I think that's pretty cool. Number 9, Samuel Guthrie. Young Samuel Guthrie is also known as Nova, though he isn't the first one to take up that mantle. There have actually been many Novas as Nova is short for Nova Centurion, and Centurion is a rank in the Nova Nova Corps, which is a Xandarian military group who are mostly used in space exploration missions. Sam was the son of Jesse Alexander, who himself was a Nova Centurion. Sam ended up taking up his father's mantle after his father appeared to go missing. Sam would later end up crash landing on Earth and warning the Avengers of the incoming Phoenix Force during the Avengers vs X-Men events. Siding with Avengers and doing his best to help them in their fight would grant Sam the opportunity to join the team. In Avengers vs X-Men Volume 1 Issue 12, Thor offered him a membership to the team. While Nova admitted he felt he didn't do much to help, he was honored and accepted, pending his mother's approval of course. Cause you know, Nova's a youngster, he's gotta ask mom. Number 8, Blue Marvel. For those who aren't familiar with Adam Brashear, he is a brilliant engineer and physicist who ended up getting superpowers similar to Carol Danvers' Captain Marvel. He can absorb energy as well, but not quite in the same way. He can only absorb antimatter energy or energy from the negative zone, basically energy not of our world or universe. So he typically does a lot of space fighting as a result, cause it's kinda where he's the most useful. He's also sometimes known for his romantic relationship with Spectrum, aka Monica Rambo. He wasn't acknowledged as an official member of the Avengers until the self-titled Mighty Avengers series volume 2 out of 2012. Luke Cage, the team leader, acknowledged him as an Avenger during the Infinity event when he was helping the team. Though we would later find out that Adam had actually been part of a team predating Luke's from the 1970s, also referred to as the Mighty Avengers. But this wouldn't happen until issue 11 of the series, whereas he was welcomed to the team officially in issue 3 in regards to comic book timeline. 
So it was in the past, but it also happened after. You know, just normal retcons of sprinkling in more flavor. Number seven, Jane Foster. After Thor found he could no longer lift his hammer, Jane began to hear the call from Mjolnir. She had Heimdall take her to it and claim the hammer for herself. She was deemed worthy enough to pick it up and became Thor. Lady Thor, that is. Despite being diagnosed with cancer and finding out that her transformation into Thor wiped away all the progress of her chemo at the time, Jane continued to perform acts of heroism as Thor. Cause she's cool and brave like that. She has joined the Avengers team in a few instances, one being when she joined the reform team in the all new, all different Avengers series. Number 6. Miles Morales Miles Morales is the Spider-Man of Earth 1610. He was mentored by Peter Parker of Earth 616 and eventually also ended up joining Earth 616 Avengers as well. He joined the team in the all new, all different Avengers series. Miles found himself tangled up with Iron Man and Sam Wilson, who was Captain America at the time, and a ragtag crew of heroes in an attempt to take down the Chitauri warlord known as Warbringer. The team wasn't referring to themselves as the Avengers yet, but of course as the series is named, that they would later be referred to as the Avengers. You're Avengers now, whether you like it or not. Number 5. Kamala Khan I was just going to straight up title her as Miss Marvel cause I mean that's who she is to me now, but Carol Danvers as Miss Marvel was part of the Avengers way before what I would consider new and I didn't want to cause any unnecessary confusion. So much respect to Kamala as Miss Marvel, but for clarity we're just going to call her by her civilian name here, Kamala Khan. I really love Kamala Khan as an Avenger as well. Kamala also joined up with the Avengers in the all new, all different Avengers series, also appearing in issue 1 where we saw Miles and Nova as well. The three Three heroes would actually later leave the Avengers to start their own superhero team known as the Champions. After helping to take down Warbringer, Stark would offer Kamala a place on the Avengers team, which of course she happily accepted. Number 4. Nadia Van Dyne Nadia Van Dyne was originally just Nadia. She was the daughter of Hank Pym and his first wife, Maria Travoya. How did she end up with Janet Van Dyne's last name? Well, she asked her if she could use it. She felt she knew and admired Van Dyne more than her parents, whom she really had never known. In fact, Nadia was was actually kidnapped at a young age and raised in Russia in the Red Room, where she was trained to become a spy, which is why we hadn't heard of her until much later. She eventually escaped her fate as a Red Room agent and decided to seek out her stepmother Janet and her father's teammates the Avengers, after learning that her father had been killed in the fight against Ultron. Nadia also took up the codename Wasp. Following the events of Civil War II, she ended up joining the Avenger team herself. Janet and the rest of the team ended up warming to her and Janet revealed that she actually approved of Nadia adopting her mantle. Aw, cute. Number 3. Dr. Tony Ho After her father died saving Tony Stark's life, Tony resented Stark and strived to be better than him. I just realized this will be confusing because both of these people are named Tony. She studied programming and engineering at Caltech and ended up earning three doctorates by the age of 20. Her time with the Avengers began on Roberto da Costa aka Sunspot's team of Avengers, AIM. Da Costa changed the acronym to stand for Avengers Idea Mechanics. She has appeared in the new Avengers comics and eventually left AIM to join the US Avengers and ended up taking up the mantle of Iron Patriot. Tony creates her own armored combat suits similar to Iron Man's, which she refers to as rescue armor. She refers to them as rescue armor probably because they're all non-lethal as well. That's kind of her thing. She's all about non-lethal fighting, keeping things safe. Number two, Ghost Rider. Robbie Reyes is the Ghost Rider we are talking about this time. He was first introduced in the all new Ghost Rider and is a car mechanic by day who street races at night in an effort to get money to help him and his brother move out of their rough neighborhood. He ends up possessed by the vengeful spirit of his uncle Eli and becomes Ghost Rider. Eventually Robbie joins up with the Avengers. You can see him fight alongside the team in the new Avengers comic series out of 2018 to 2019 volume 8. At one point he even becomes the heart of an event where he is granted the powers of the other Avengers so that he can eventually go up against and hopefully take on what appears to be the Dark Celestials. Appears to be anyways. I know. What a story, right? He's also just a really sweet older brother. Also, cars. Number one, Voyager. Vini Gost is the daughter of Grandmaster and Dwi Gost. She originally used her powers to infiltrate the Avengers, inserting herself into their memories to make them believe she was a long lost founding member of the team known as Valerie Vector. Voyager did that for her dad, and Dwi Gost, to help him protect his title of Grandmaster, basically to help guarantee a winning wager on a contest he had gambled his title on with her uncle Challenger, who saw to win the bet and usurp her father. 
He used to be the Grandmaster before. Anyways, it's a lot of history, so we'll skip that. In the end, her true identity was revealed by Jarvis. After being inspired by the Avengers' true heroics, she decided to switch sides, defecting and seeking to help them and Earth instead. In the end, they offered Voyager a membership. Though she declined, she did agree to return to reclaim her membership at a later time. And in the series Avengers No Road Home, she is acknowledged as an Avenger on the character intro page. Number 10. Dark Avengers The Dark Avengers were first introduced in their own comic book series in Dark Avengers issue number 1. Not everyone is a fan of them, because while they are kind of Avengers, they are also kind of go against a lot of the things that the original team stood for. The Dark Avengers are led by Norman Osborn, who gets to make his own organization, Hammer, to safeguard the world's safety following the crumbling of S.H.I.E.L.D. and after his victory against the Skrull Queen, whose death was brought about by Osborn and was also televised, making him a worldwide hero in the eyes of many. Despite the fact that, yeah, he was still definitely a villain. Still, although this team was comprised of villains, they did aim to do good things, just in their own way. In truth, they became more a team of anti-heroes than anything, with just a dash of villainous escapades organized by their leader, Osborn, who at this point went by Iron Patriot. Sort of like the Iron Man of this Dark Avengers crew. Number 9. Avengers Academy Avengers Academy was a series that replaced the Avengers The Initiative series. As that series ended, this one began. The Avengers Academy team was a group of super powered youths who were selected to be trained as new Avengers. Although originally the teens thought that they had been selected due to the promise that they showed, it was later revealed that they had been selected because of the great risk that they would ultimately become villains. In fact, six of the teens were actually working for Norman Osborn during the Dark Avengers Hammer Dark Rain days and likely could have ended up being trained by him to become Dark Avengers, should that whole situation have continued to play out. However, when the Avengers found out about them, they instead decided to create the Avengers Academy in an attempt to repurpose and redeem those youths, so basically took them in themselves. Hank Pym acted as the headmaster of this academy, while Tigra, Justice, Quicksilver and Speedball took on roles as teachers. Number 8. Secret Avengers this team operated for three years in the comics. It was led by Commander Steve Rogers and Sharon Carter. After the dissolution of Hammer and the Dark Avengers, Steve was now left to decide what should come after. Instead of reforming S.H.I.E.L.D. or the Avengers, he decided to secure global safety through the use of various smaller Avengers teams. Secret Avengers was one of those teams that he himself led and was a black ops unit used for covertly dealing with the problems that Osborn, Hammer and the Dark Avengers had left behind and created during their reign. Members included Black Widow, Ant-Man, Beast, Moon Knight, War Machine, Nova and a Valkyrie named Brunhilde. They were eventually Eventually disbanded by Hawkeye following their fight against the Descendants. But man, was it a fun and weird run. Seriously, if you haven't checked out Secret Avengers, you should maybe do it. It's pretty strange. I kind of love it. Number 7. Mighty Avengers Granted, there is more than one Mighty Avengers team, but for the purpose of this list, we're talking about Luke Cage's Mighty Avengers. This team of Avengers formed to look after the Earth after the main Avengers team was forced to roll out when the Builders threatened the entire universe. Yeah, that was a thing. Remember that? During the Avengers absence, Thanos returned to Earth and the Mighty Avengers stepped in to protect their people and their planet. The team was led by Luke Cage and included such heroes as Spectrum, White Tiger and Blue Marvel, as well as Superior Spider-Man, who at one point attempted to overtake leadership of the team, fighting Luke Cage for it. Number 6. AIM I know what you're thinking, AIM? Wait, but what? AIM was originally the villainous organization of genius level scientists, also known as Advanced Idea Mechanics, who aimed, <laughs> get it, aimed, to overthrow the government and rule the world using technological advancements. So what are you talking about Amanda? How can they be an Avengers team? Well, this organization eventually was taken over by mutant and hero Sunspot, Roberto da Costa. Sunspot renamed the organization Avengers Idea Mechanics and set up to reclaim and reform it. He used the organization for good, filling it with more noble, brilliant minds who developed tech to help with Sunspot's new Avengers rescue missions. Roberto basically merged his new Avengers team with AIM to create this new technologically advanced Avengers team. Previously, that new Avengers team was actually known as the Multiversal Avengers, and originally they were all about discovering the reason behind the gradual disintegration of the multiverse. Halfway through into number five, Groot. Okay, so this is a pretty weird one, I have to admit. But technically speaking, baby Groot is the offspring of Groot. And while yes, 
He is also just Groot. Baby and teen Groot are younger versions of Groot, and that's basically what a child is. Just a younger version of yourself. And while this may have been a asexually produced offspring, so what? This counts in my book. And while you may consider Groot a guardian of the galaxy and not an Avenger, he served as an Avenger for a time in both the comics and in the MCU. So you can back off, boy, okay? This is a very meta number, I know. But we've included clones on lists like these before. This is close enough, it's fine with me. Kids are basically clones. We've talked about actual clones, so deal with it. And at four, Sarah Rogers. In an alternate world where the heroes and villains assembled for the Secret Wars never left Battle World, the location of the conflict, the combatants called a truce and settled down to raise families. Sarah Rogers was actually the daughter of Steve Rogers, Captain America, and the X-Men Rogue. In this reality, Rogue was referred to as Carol, indicating that the stolen psyche of the adventure Carol Danvers was in control of Rogue's body, and given Sarah's existence, had learned to control Rogue's powers enough to conceive a child. Malfactor, Vincent Von Doom, the son of Doctor Doom, tried to take over the battle world and return to Earth in order to follow in his father's footsteps and conquer it, because of course! But Sarah led her fellow young heroes to stop Vincent and along the way grabbed Mjolnir, proving her worthiness to wield the enchanted hammer. So, as a kid, yeah, you're on the list, don't worry. And at three, Hulk Gang. The Hulk Gang is a gang of hillbilly Hulks who are the result of Hulk impregnating his first cousin's She-Hulk. Though not willingly, might I add. Most of the Hulk Gang members though are grandchildren of Bruce Banner, who have become run-of-the-mill thugs, beating or killing people when they don't pay their rent on time. When the Hulk Gang found Logan and he didn't have his money to pay the rent for his farm, its members Bobby Joe, Charlie, and Otis Banner paid a visit to him and punished him for missing a payment. Shortly before leaving though, they said that he had to pay double next month, otherwise they would kill him and his family. However, while Logan was away delivering a package with Hawkeye to get the money that he actually owed them, the Hulk Gang got bored and murdered his family. Once Logan returned home and learned about what happened in his absence from his neighbor Abraham, he went after the Hulk gang and killed all of the members that he actually encountered, including Bobby Joe, Charlie, Otis, Rufus, Woody, Bo, Elrod, Eustace, and Luke Banner. So uh, atta boy Logan. But ultimately, in at number two, Vivian Vision. Viv was a synthesoid created by the Vision in his process to humanize himself through the creation of a family. The brain waves of Viv and her twin brother Vin come from the combination of the brain patterns of Vision and Virginia, Viv and Vin's mother and Vision's wife. The Visions moved to Arlington, Virginia in order to facilitate Vision becoming the Avengers White House liaison, but I also kind of find that funny. <laughs> Vision, Virginia, Viv, and Vin moved to Virginia. Come on. <laughs> The family though became instant celebrities with their neighbors, constantly seeking pictures and then them posting them online. This caught the attention of Eric Williams, who became upset that Vision would create a family that appeared to be happy, when the Williams family wasn't. Which, I mean like, what? That's like getting mad at an Instagram model for faking your life. <laughs> as well as the fact that the Vision's brainwaves were taken from his brother Simon in the first place. Both Viv and Finn attended school at the Alexander Hamilton High School in Fairfax, but they were assigned different schedules to help them assimilate with their class. Mates. Considering how I previously said that Ultron assimilated a whole load of robots, you kind of have to admit the word assimilate their classmates is kind of setting off a few red flags here. And finally, in at number one, Lyra. The daughter of Thundra, the Empress of the United Sisterhood, and the Incredible Hulk on Earth 8009, Lyra was gifted with the strength of her parents and trained as an elite warrior for the Sisterhood in their fight against men. But, unlike the other Gamma Mutants, Lyra secretly grew weaker the angrier she got. Lyra was called by the Gaunisher to head a secret mission, one not even her select band of warrior compatriots were aware of. The Sisterhood's cradle was malfunctioning, causing defective births, and without a replacement circuit it would be the end of the Sisterhood's ability to replenish their numbers, eventually leading to their extinction. Lyra was armed with Boudica, a wristwatch with an artificial intelligence linked to the, both the Sisterhood and Gynosher at all times, and sent to the men's cradle to steal the appropriate parts to repair their own cradle. When a traitor turned on Lyra at the request of the Gynosher, the replacement parts were destroyed in their fight. Lyra returned to Gynosher to confront her for her treachery, but was then sent to Earth 616 to seek out the great Norman Osborn and breed with him. Man, Norman Osborn, man. Every time. Starting us off in at number 10, Professor Hulk. While it seems that it's a given that Clint Barton would want to return to his family as he initially planned before Captain America Civil War, and you know, 
end up doing whatever his Disney Plus show will have him up to. One major question left hanging about the previous Avengers team is what on earth the Hulk is going to do now. It seems that Professor Hulk, the nickname of the Banner and Hulk fusion that he's become, may act as a scientific advisor of sorts to the new Avengers, or perhaps even find himself on the team. With Fury seemingly having his hands full with this multiverse business, who better to help rally the troops, inspire them, and keep them up to date with what's scientifically what than a genius X member of the previous iteration? Plus, who doesn't love Mark Ruffalo? Please keep him Marvel. Studios. In at number 9, The Wasp. When the team first formed in 1963 in the Avengers issue 1, Earth's Mightiest Heroes consisted of Iron Man, Thor, the Hulk, Ant Man, and the Wasp, with Captain America joining after he was defrosted in issue 4. Their very first mission had them pitted against Thor's brother, Loki, and the group realized how well they worked together, deciding that they should form a team. It was Wasp who named the group Avengers, a slightly different take than how the name came to be in the MCU. But it does bring to attention the fact that Wasp was once a very important character in the comics as far as the Avengers were concerned, and remained that way in the comics for years and years, giving the MCU version of her more of a chance to shine despite you know not being the original Janet Van Dyne may go a long way with comic fans who adored the original iteration of the team, and would love to see part of that adapted into the films. Moving on to number 8, Ant-Man. Scott Lang has definitely earned his stripes in the MCU. Now with two solo features and playing a major role in reversing the snap in Endgame, Ant-Man is very much a hero who has come into his own, and would add a really solid set of skills to a new Avengers team. Plus, he'd make for some fantastic banter, especially when paired up with the likes of some of the more serious heroes that the MCU has to offer. His inclusion would be yet another way to fill the Iron Man shaped void in the team, especially from a scientific perspective. Scott has Hank Pym at his side, who just so happens to also be the father of the new Wasp, Hope. And with the multiverse now very much a thing in the MCU, Hank's involvement and work with the quantum realm could really go a long way in fighting whatever threat the gang faces next, especially if it's the highly speculated Kang the Conqueror, who is all about his time travel and hopping around different dimensions. And at number 7, Sam Wilson. At the end of Avengers Endgame, we saw Steve Rogers return as an old man after his mission with the Infinity Stones to pass on the mantle of Captain America to his successor, which was none other than Falcon, Sam Wilson. While some fans were up in arms over the choice, a lot of people felt that it should have been Bucky or that Steve and Bucky deserved better closure, we now have the opportunity to really see Sam shine. And kick some major butt as a completely different kind of Captain America. Where the mantle will take him, who knows. But what we do know is that he does stand a solid chance of ending up on the Avengers. The one argument against that though is the fact that he's slated to have a show coming up on Disney's streaming service alongside the Winter Soldier, Bucky Barnes. And quite frankly, watching those two in some sort of buddy comedy action pack program may just be enough to satisfy us. Can the Avengers do without another Captain America? Well, only time will tell. And at number 6, Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange always seems to be a superhero living just on the outside of the core group of characters in the MCU. He's a very important hero though, being a connection to all things mystical, having a ceaseless stream of wisdom and knowledge that has really come in handy in the past. And he's slated to get a sequel solo film too. While we'd love to see Doctor Strange join up with the Avengers, we'd be curious to see how his dynamic would play into the team, now that the seemingly ripe combination of Iron Strange is behind us. That is the ship name for Doctor Strange and Iron Man in case you were wondering. We'll never forget how fantastic their banter was. <sighs> and at number 5, Shuri. When Shuri first appeared in the MCU in Black Panther, we quickly learned how completely badass she was. Not only is she the smartest person in the MCU currently, she's also incredibly charismatic. And the internet was quick to ship her and Peter Parker, despite the two never having met. Now imagine an iteration of the Avengers in which her and Spider Man gallivanted around, being the best of pals, saving lives, and kicking crime's butt. It may be wishful thinking, but Shuri being added to the team would be a wise choice, especially since she has so much to offer when it comes to brains and brawn. Speaking of badass women, in at number four, Valkyrie. Now that Thor's off somewhere in space, who better to replace him on the team than another Asgardian? One who was given the throne to new Asgard and and reigns as queen. Valkyrie was a huge hit in Thor Ragnarok, to the point where fans expressed their disappointment that she was nowhere to be seen in Avengers Infinity War. Now that changed in Endgame, when the badass hero played by Tessa Thompson showed up on a freaking Pegasus. Stop. Could you be any cooler? She'd definitely be able to fill in for the God of Thunder, and may even add a bit of romance to the team too. The internet has been hardcore shipping her and a certain character played by Brie Larson who most definitely will end up on the Avengers team. So who knows what the future holds. Regardless 
regardless, Valkyrie has proven to be capable of kicking major butt. And she'd definitely have a solid chance for membership, with her potentially being able to give us a few comical moments similar to Thor's when it comes to understanding Earth's social norms. Except more sarcastic, we hope. Moving on to number three, Black Panther. Black Panther proved to be one of the most popular and successful solo films that the MCU has released to date. T'Challa, the King of Wakanda, is a character who has a whole lot of story left to explore, and we already know that a sequel is in the works. It seems likely that Marvel Studios would want to continue the hype around Black Panther and explore more of what Wakanda and the character's history in the comics has to offer by plopping him into Marvel's team of mighty heroes. I mean, come on, Black Panther would be a dope addition to the Avengers. He's already fought alongside them too. He knows his way around a battle, and he's a king. Talk about resources. I don't got that Stark money no more, that's for sure. Too soon. And at number two, Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel is the most powerful superhero we've encountered so far in the MCU. And that's a fact, confirmed by Marvel Studios themselves. Captain Marvel, aka Carol Danvers, has a whole lot of story to explore, which is yet another fact confirmed by the studios. Her first feature film gave us a look at her backstory, set up the political landscape between two major warring extraterrestrial races, and gave us a glimpse at just what Carol is capable of doing on the battlefield. We got to see her in action yet again in Endgame, even holding her own against Thanos who was wearing the Infinity Gauntlet at the time. So naturally, many people believe she'll be the one to step in Captain America's shoes, acting as the leader of the Avengers, with at least another two solo films likely on their way if the rollout of Phase 2 and 3 are anything to go by. Plus, she already has a connection to S.H.I.E.L.D. via her pal Nick Fury, or I guess what's left of S.H.I.E.L.D. So it seems that she's perfectly set up to join the team, assuming she's done with her spacefaring days for a while. And finally, in at number 1, Spider-Man. In Avengers Infinity War, Tony Stark made Peter Parker an official Avenger, something the youngster at the time was ecstatic over, despite, you know, being thrust into space. Now that Tony has died, many people believe that Peter will really have to step up, which is something that was only further emphasized in the trailers for Spider Man Far From Home. Based on his experience and the fact that he's got quite the intellect, it seems likely that Parker will be learning the meaning of great power means great responsibility sooner rather than later, now being one of the only heroes that the likes of Nick Fury can turn to in a time of need. And from a strictly marketing purpose, you know damn well that Marvel. Studios is going to keep Spider Man around for a long, long time. He's young, he's charismatic, and he's the publisher's biggest hero as far as the comics are concerned. So expect to see Peter Parker as part of the team in upcoming phases. That's practically a certainty. In at number 10, Deadpool. With the merger between Disney and Fox, there have been tons of rumors surrounding the members of the X Men, the Fantastic Four, and even the Merc with a mouth coming over to the new Avengers. The most likely is Deadpool. He has a history with the Avengers, and the only thing that Disney executives have to work out is translating the R rated star into the more family friendly audience of the MCU. According to online rumors, Deadpool is set to appear in the end credits scene of Black Widow, spoiler alert, and therefore will be joined the new team of Avengers very soon. We are still waiting on Kevin Feige to confirm, but he did note that the movie is happening with a whole new lineup of Avengers, which is pretty exciting. And it's actually even more exciting news that we'll continue to speculate on throughout the rest of this list. In at number 9, Hulkling. Word on the street is that Marvel is casting for Teddy Altman aka Hulkling for an upcoming project that we can only hope is the new Avengers team. Based on a report from Geeks Worldwide, this young Avenger should be joining the cast of Wanda vision at some point. The other reason why there is good speculation for Hulkling to be joining the new Avengers in regards to the MCU is the upcoming release of the new Avengers Empire comic. In the comic, Hulkling will lead as the star coming to end the beef between his people the Kree and the Skrulls. The fact that this comic book release date is lining up so perfectly, the fact that this comic book's release date is lining up so perfectly with an intro to the MCU means we are hopeful that Teddy will finally get his shot. In at number 8, Songbird. Her real name is Melissa Gold, she was a troubled runaway from an alcoholic father and a mother that was locked in prison. Due to her needing to survive on the streets, Melissa developed a hard edge to her personality that she would later use to her advantage when becoming a professional wrestler the Screaming Mimi. Her transition to the new Avengers was a bit of a bumpy road to say the least. Under the supervision of John Garrett, Songbird infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D. as a double agent. When her cover was finally blown though, she admitted her betrayal and thus became a triple agent after siding with Bobby DaCosta. Still a good member to the new Avengers. In at number 7, Squirrel Girl. Her real name is Dorian Green, and whether you like it or not, she is a valued member of the new Avengers. Moving away from the MCU for a moment, Squirrel Girl undoubtedly has a big fan base and has proved her worth many times. She is a former member of the Great Lakes Avengers, and when Luke Cage and Jessica Jones needed a babysitter, they hired her. I mean, 
bit of a slap in the face considering all that she has done in the comic books, but hey, she's still considered to be a new Avenger team member. In at number 6, Enigma. Also known as Pod and now Pod 2, Jokinen was an ethnically Finnish Norwegian girl. Due to her proximity of the Pod system armor crash landing, she was bonded to the suit and remained in a cocoon that was later discovered by the Advanced Idea Mechanics, or AIM for short. At first she quickly defeated the Avengers, but soon she was captured by them before Bobby DaCosta took over AIM. Over time and after some successful missions, Pod would become Sunspot's bodyguard and member of the new Avengers. Dr. Tony Ho, whom Amanda mentioned on the first part, became increasingly fascinated with Pod and even started to fall in love with the person inside of that armor. How sweet. Number 5. All New All Different Avengers This was both its own new team of Avengers in a series as well as being known as the name for kind of an entire Marvelverse soft relaunch, including a variety of spin-offs that took place in 2015, known as the All New All Different Verse. This relaunch included a variety of series including one of my faves, All New Wolverine. But for the purpose of this list, we'll be talking about the All New All Different Avengers founding team and the individual comic series itself that was about them. Following Secret Wars, this All New All Different Avengers team was formed. Originally it was comprised of Iron Man, Sam Wilson who was Captain America at the time, Miss Marvel aka Kamala Khan, Miles Morales as Spider-Man, young Sam Alexander as Nova, Vision and Jane Foster's Thor. Iron Man would act as their leader but this team wouldn't even officially refer to themselves as Avengers until the very end of issue number 3 of their series. This was a refresh on the Avenger team, one that had no tower, no funding, and wasn't officially even recognized yet. Over time they would become more established, but the all new all different team would only exist as it was for 15 issues, up until the events of Civil War 2. Number 4, A Force. The first all female team of Avengers. It took us over 50 years, but eventually we got there. This this team had two self-titled comic series, though sadly both were very, very short. The team was originally led by She-Hulk, and its members would include Captain Marvel, Medusa, Singularity, Dazzler, and Nico Minoru. A-Force originally took their name from the name for the defenders of the matriarchal nation of Arcadia on Battleworld, where She-Hulk reigned as a baroness. The team was created during the Secret Wars event involving Emperor Doom's Battleworld, and would continue to exist up until the events of Civil War II, when She-Hulk was put into a coma. It's kind of how that whole thing starts. Well, it's part of the start anyways. Number 3, US Avengers. The US Avengers is a strange and eclectic team, but also a fun and patriotic one. They worked alongside SHIELD, but were also considered independent of the organization. This team actually coincided with another Avenger related one that I mentioned earlier, Avengers Idea Mechanics, the new AIM. Sunspot, who was operating under the popular alias of Citizen 5, led and created this team. It was comprised of a quirky yet popular group of heroes, including Robert Maverick's Red Hulk, Cannon Ball, Tony Ho's Iron Patriot, Squirrel Girl, Pod, and the time displaced daughter of Luke Cage and Jessica Jones from an alternate future known as Danielle Cage, aka her alternate universe's Captain America. I love Danielle Cage, she's pretty cool. Number 2, Occupy Avengers. I almost said Octopus Avengers, which is not a thing. <laughs> But maybe it should be a thing, I don't know, they could be a team, they're all octopuses. This series and Avengers spin-off was a small one. It consisted mainly of Hawkeye and followed his adventures on a path for redemption following the events of Civil War II. Let's not forget that it was Hawkeye's arrow that was deemed responsible for the death of Bruce Banner, although Banner had asked that Hawkeye mercy kill him should it be necessary. Although he was acquitted of all murder charges, Hawkeye still felt guilty and sought to make things right. His way of doing this? A more grassroots approach to heroism involving basically a community outreach. Clint focused on more real world problems that threatened people like fixing up Santa Rosa, New Mexico's water supply. During the run of Occupy Avengers, Hawkeye would be joined by other heroes such as Red Wolf and Nightshade who would join him on his quest. Number 1. Savage Avengers This ruthless team of Avengers is basically one of the newest anti-hero Avenger teams to form, and is more anti-hero than our number 10 spot, the Dark Avengers, because all the members are still definitely the good guys, but are also known for being violent killers as well. This team was formed out of a team up involving Wolverine and Conan the Barbarian. It consists of Elektra, Dr. Voodoo, formerly known as Brother Voodoo, Elektra, Punisher, and Venom. The team was assembled to combat the combined threat of spell casters and spell traders from Conan's world and Marvel's main continuity evil secret ninja organization known as The Hand. 